All right, okay, we'll figure it out. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's start. Hi, everyone, welcome back. So last time I was talking about the Xi arrangement. Xi arrangement. It's i minus xj. It's either 0 or 1 for all i less than j. And what we concluded was that uh, it has a characteristic polynomial, which is very nice, c times c minus n to the n minus 1 is in the finite field method. In particular, plugging in negative 1, you get the number of regions. which is uh, n plus 1 to the n minus 1. And if you plug in plus 1, then you get the number of bounded regions, which is n minus 1 to the n minus 1. And because these are nice numbers, you can ask, well, is there a bijective proof? Can you choose some objects which are known to be counted by these numbers, maybe trees or Arkin functions? And stuff like that and you can ask like how do you assign to every region a, a tree or a parking function and that's actually the used to be an open problem but anyways bijective proof bijective proof is going to be i guess in the homework so i promised to, to do homework too by today but actually yeah this week is busy Let, let's at some point, I'm going to put up homework too, hopefully very soon. And yeah, it is going to be the last homework of this class. Yeah, and uh, by the way, I, I don't have any quota on how many A's I can give. So don't worry too much about the grades and everything. Just try to do your best with the homework, and then uh, you'll get some good grade, hopefully. All right, so uh, today I want to finish the hyperplane arrangement section. And I want to just mention the Catalan arrangement, which is also going to be in the homework. Catalan arrangement, which xi minus xj is equal to negative 1, 0, or 1, where i is less than j, although here it doesn't really matter. And the picture you're supposed to remember is I take the braid arrangement and then I add, yeah, let me actually use a different color. Maybe orange, I add an orange hyperplane above and below each of my original hyperplanes. All right. What was the number of regions and bounded regions? Oh, for, for this, so this is, well, you know, let me call it fancy C and what is the number of regions of C3? 30, okay. What is the number of bounded regions of 12? Okay. And yeah, so I asked what, what is, why is it called the Catalan arrangement? And, uh, I guess I, I should tell you the answer. And the answer is that uh, it contains the braid arrangement. Right? It, there is a braid arrangement plus some extra hyperplane. That one arrangement contains the braid arrangement, but not only does it contain the braid arrangement, it's also symmetric. If you, there is a symmetric group action on the on the whole arrangement. If you permute the coordinates in any way you want, you, you still get the same hyperplanes. In particular, the there's n factorial regions of the braid arrangement. So the number of regions should be divisible by n factorial, is what I mean. If you divide by n factorial, you get uh, 5 times 6, and here you get 2 times 6. Mm. So, 
here. So these are the two, these are the Catalan numbers. Okay. In general, R of Cn is the Catalan number times n factorial, and number of bounded regions of Cn is the previous Catalan number times n factorial. And, and why is that? Well, I can tell you the whole, the whole characteristic polynomial of the Catalan arrangement is just given by C times C minus N minus 1, C minus N minus 2, etc. cetera, C minus 2N plus 1. So again, a very nice factorization like this. And uh, yeah, maybe I should try. OK, so, so the try plugging in T to be plus one or minus, yeah, let's try. So let's say number of regions. I should plug in t equals to what? Minus one, okay. And then I'm gonna ignore the signs. So this is gonna be minus one, minus n, minus one. It's gonna be n plus two times n plus three, etc. And the next, the last one is gonna be two n. Is this, uh, what, yeah, what, okay. So n choose n over n plus one times n factorial. Okay, yeah, very nice. And you can do the same if you plug in plus one, you're gonna get, yeah, number of bounded regions by the same reasoning is gonna be two n minus two, choose n minus one over n times n factorial. I mean, I can, I can do, yeah, let's, because I want you to, to be convinced that I'm right. So the number of bounded regions is plug in t equals to one, I get n times uh, n plus one, all the way up to two n minus two. And this is indeed two n minus two, choose n minus one, times one over n, times n factorial. Does that make sense? All right, yeah, so that's the general characteristic polynomial. You can compute this using the finite field method, so it's gonna be, gonna be also homework two. I mean, an optional problem on homework number two. You don't, have, you don't really, have to solve any of the hard problems. But uh, yeah, that's, there is actually, for the number of regions, there is a nice bijective proof. Uh, yeah, so each, each of these regions contains five, yeah, so there's Catalan many regions inside of each braid arrangement region, and there's actually a bijection between these regions and some Catalan objects. So you can, you can, you can do this either bijectively or using the finite field method. Right, any questions on hyperplane arrangements? All right. Matroids. So all the way up to this point, I was what I was trying to do is just motivate matroids. When I introduce matroids, you wouldn't have to ask why why am I doing this? Here's the definition. A matroid. A matroid is, well, I like to think of it as, yeah, okay, so, so formally, let's say it's a fair E comma fancy I, where uh, E is a, just an arbitrary finite set which is called, I'm gonna call it the ground set of, of my matroid. And I is, the, is a certain collection of subsets of E. So I also gonna denote it by I of M. These are the, these are called independent sets of M, and they have to satisfy some axioms. 
So for matroids, to define matroids, there's many different definitions. Each of them involves a bunch of axioms. And so here, there's going to be three axioms. And with the axioms, there's always like, all of them are trivial except for one, which is called the exchange axiom. So for the first trivial axiom is that I contains the empty set. Second axiom is that if you have uh, if you have a set J, which is independent, and you take a subset I of J, then I is independent. Okay. And well, okay. So here here goes the exchange axiom. If you have two sets, two independent sets i and j, and suppose that this has fewer elements, that i has fewer elements than j, size of i strictly less than the size of j, then the claim is that I can add some element of j to i and still get an independent set. Uh, so for um, j in j minus i, I have i, the joint union j, belongs to my set of independent sets. And that's it. That's the definition of a matroid. Which, basically, philosophically, uh, yeah, I'm going to give some examples, but philosophically, if you have a collection of factors, and you want to capture all the information about these factors, more or less, then you can just record which of them form independent sets. And, well, maybe not all information, but you get a lot of information. Uh, and somehow it's very beautiful that you only get to have one interesting axiom, and it already gives you all the complexity of vector configurations. Without, yeah, but, but for now, if you are writing the computer program, then it may, if, if I give you a bunch of actual like floating point vectors in space, uh, you have to check which ones are independent. After that, you get only combinatorics. This is all just discrete, yeah? Uh, right, so uh, I is a collection of subsets of E. I has two to the E. All right, so examples. So most of these examples you've already seen. The first one is, let's say I start with a vector configuration. Of n vectors in R to the D. Then, as I said, you just record the independent, which, so you set uh, the ground set to be just bracket n. And you set this fancy i. So I'm going to denote this matroid by m sub b. And the i of the independent sets of this matroid are just i subset bracket n such that the vectors in i are linearly independent. And you can check the axioms from just linear algebra. Yeah? Yeah, that's an amazing question, and I'm going to ask it in 10 minutes, and then you're going to tell, well, you're going to try to guess. And some of you may know the answer, but if you don't know the answer, then you, yeah. Uh, or maybe I should try, yeah, maybe I should try now. Uh, so question. Is it true that 
every matroid is obtained in this way from some um, vector configuration. Let's vote. Who thinks the answer is yes? One, yes. Uh, who thinks the answer is no? One, two, three. Most people are unsure. Yeah, OK. Uh, interesting. If this were true, why would I define the concept of a matroid? Yeah, well, I mean, even if this is true, there could be many kind of, you, you would basically get all theorems of geometry. You know, there is a whole bunch of theorems in, in planar geometry, let's say, and you would get all of them from just very simple axioms. So that, in a sense, this is, this is very useful because you don't have to think of linear functions and stuff like that. You can just sort of think of sets and their intersections and subtract subtracting one set from the other. Still, this would be very useful. But yeah, the answer is no. The answer is no, and so such mat such matroids such matroids which are obtained from M sub V are called realizable realizable over R and not every matroid is realizable over R. So what is the famous example of a non-realizable? OK, this is bad. Maybe, maybe it's all right. So what is the famous example of a non-realizable matroid? It's called the Fano matroid. And what you do is, well, I guess I have to tell you, I guess I have to tell you some, uh, some other example. Before I, before I talk about the final matroid, let me do some other example. Because basically the idea is that vector configurations are nice, but they live in, vector configurations live in D dimensions, but you can also look, think of point configurations, which live in D minus one dimension. So I wanna, I want to uh, draw matroids, and for that, I'm going to need point configurations. Uh, another example is if you have A, a bunch of points, A n in R to the D minus 1 times n, then uh, your ground set is still bracket n. But what is the set of independent sets of the corresponding matroid? Uh, you're asking how to go from vector configuration to the point configuration. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm asking if I give you a, a number of points in R to the D minus 1, how can you associate a natural matroid to that collection of points? Uh, you, want, you want to do the same exact? Well, OK, so <laughs> you can do the same exact uh, construction. Yeah, you can treat each of these points as a vector. Uh, right, okay, I want to think of these points as a defined modular shift. Then you can't literally do that construction. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the way, the actual standard way to go between point configurations and vector configurations is that if you have a point configuration, you put it in one dimension up, so here is your point configuration A, and then here is the origin, and then you convert each point into a vector from the origin in some plane. Yeah, so you choose some plane which does not pass through the origin, and then, yeah, so that's, that is to me the 
correspondence between point configurations and vector configurations. And that gives you like triangulations go into zone topple tilings and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, right. So no matter how you shift, it's just a linear transformation of the ambient space. So. Okay, nice. So linear independence for vectors like this becomes a fine independence. So I subset bracket n such that uh, AI, I and I are a finely independent. And let's actually, yeah, let's try an example because I want to. I want to I want to be able to draw pictures and then I want you to be able to know what the matroid is. So maybe I draw the following picture. See I have two lines and then this is one, two, three, and then these two points are the same. I'm not telling you where the origin is in this picture, but just a point configuration in the plane. So what are what are the independent sets of this point configuration? One, two, four. One, two, five. Hmm? Uh, every, every single time. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. The empty set. Every pair, other than, oh, yeah, all pairs except four, five. One, three, four. One, three, five. Two, three, four. Two, three, five. Is that it? Okay. Yeah, so that's basically, I draw a picture, you should think of this data. That's, uh, yeah, now I guess I can draw the Fanon matroid. So the Fanon matroid is, I draw the following picture. So I start with seven points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this is a realizable matroid. It comes from a point configuration, which can be converted into a vector configuration. This is, this is realizable. Over R. And now I draw the same picture. And then I do some weird, I draw a weird circle. So what does this mean? It means that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It means that I took my original matroid and I declared that one set is no longer independent. So. So if this is A, then this matroid here is defined as follows. So I take for this matroid M, what I do is I take the independent sets of A, and then I subtract 2, 4, 6. Yeah? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, actually, uh, that's, I guess, the next thing I'm going to say. Right, so, so uh, first of all, why is it not realizable over R? That's, I mean, that's an, a planar geometry exercise. You can, you, can, you can try to prove from your high school knowledge of geometry that if you have a picture like this, then 2, 4, and 6 cannot lie on the line. Same line. And, yeah, it's... A lot of non-realizable matroids come from theorems of planar geometry. There, yeah? Uh, well, right, yeah, there is a way to, to tell the dimension from the size of a maximal independent set. All right, so 
I should still explain, yeah, this, uh, as Andrew mentioned, this is realizable over F2. So this is not realizable. First of all, you have to check that all axioms are still satisfied. And the, uh, the, for the last axiom, you have to actually do some work to, yes? I just incre uh, zoom in, zoom out a little bit, and it, I think it should put out the focus, yeah. All right, does it work, no? Okay, all right, yeah. Okay, keep me posted. Uh, yeah, so this is not realizable over R, but is realizable over, uh, over F2. Uh, okay, so the idea is that I, I need to, first of all, this, like, this linear algebra uh, argument that makes this, these axioms true works over any field. You don't have to work over R to kind of, if you have a bigger independent set and a smaller independent set, you can always choose an extra vector that works over any field. In particular, it turns out that the notion of realizability depends on the field. And uh, yeah, basically what you do is you consider, you take your field and you raise it to the third pop. So you take a three dimensional space over this field and then that's where your vectors are gonna leave. And then each, basically a vector configuration is, this is a finite collection of points. And you take all of them except for the origin. So there is eight points in this space, and I remove the origin, so I get seven points left, and these are just going to be binary, non-zero binary vectors, and I can even put them on the picture. So uh, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, and then these are one one zero and zero one one and one zero one and then this guy is one 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 yeah okay that's a good question as well right so but before that let me actually let me actually check that this works uh so maybe I mean, I should justify why am I, so what does align mean? Align means that the three points are, the, the three vectors, right, I'm talking about vector configuration. So the three vectors are linearly dependent. That's the condition. And indeed, this is the sum of these two vectors. And this one, one, zero is the sum of these two vectors. Yeah, so all these lines, you can actually pretty easily see that they are actual, uh, linear dependencies between vectors. But what about the circle? Is that a linear dependence? What's the linear dependence? Okay, nice. Yeah, the sum, the sum of these three vectors is two, 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 which is zero in F2. So, so that's why it's realizable over F2. And yeah, the, to, to answer your question, yes, there are matrices which are not realizable over any field. So indeed, this definition here gives you uh, an abstraction of vector configurations, which works really well. Well, you can prove a lot of theorems. You can generalize a lot of theorems from geometry to this sort of abstract language using only these simple axioms. But you do get new matroids. And you can try to characterize which matroids are realizable. Like maybe you can somehow forbid this as a pattern in your matroid. And that problem is insanely complicated. So nobody knows how to, like, if I give you a big matroid, nobody knows how to check if it's realizable over which field is it realizable in fact. Yeah. Any questions so far? I, I, I still want to, I still want to keep uh, giving you examples.
Because I want to explain that Metro has generalized everything we have, we've had so far. So other examples are if I have a hyperplane arrangement. Then the ground set is bracket n. What is the matroid? Uh, oh yeah, let's assume that they are central. Assume central. Central. Yeah, otherwise you have to go one dimension up and yeah, let, let's assume central. <laughs> the question again, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, what about, yeah, what if I just take the normal vectors? Okay, that's actually, so if I take uh, V1, Vn, where each Vi is just Hi verb, then the corresponding Ma is just by definition the matroid associated with the vector configuration of normal vectors. But, uh, don't they have to choose these normal vectors? There's there's some freedom. Right? That, well, yeah, each vector is defined after scaling, so. Well, actually, yeah, here I'm considering different hyperplanes, so no two vectors here are going to be equal to each other. But, okay, so the question is, does the matroid actually depend on rescaling the vectors? The answer, or no? Okay. Yeah, okay. That's true. So that, that, that doesn't depend depend on the choice of V. But you have to check this in order to associate a well-defined matroid to uh, A. All right. Let's try some other example. Namely, let's say I have a graph. Uh, I'm going to assume, here I'm assuming central. Let me, let me assume connected. This is a minor assumption, but for simplicity, connected. But uh, let me allow multi multi graphs. So multi graph means you can have self loops or uh, pairs of parallel edges. Yeah. Oh, I see. So you want ah, interesting. Is that is that a matroid? Okay. So you wanna. That's not what I'm. What I was gonna say. But uh, let's actually think about it. Interesting. Cool. All right. So if G is a path of length three, then one, three form an independent set, and two forms an independent set, but the axiom does not hold. Okay, so what what is the what what are some other some uh, suggestions? For take take the adjacency matrix and and take the vectors from the adjacency. So adjacency matrix is square, right? There is going to be n vectors in R to the n. Right? Uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, so, so, so the way is to associate some bunch of vectors to this graph and then yeah, to take the corresponding matroid of that vector configuration. But n vectors in R to the n is not too interesting because usually if, if they form a basis, it's fine. If, if it's not, then yeah, by the way, for the vector configuration, I should assume that they span R to the D. Yeah? Oh, nice. Okay, right. So to generalize all the graph, we associate a zonotope and a hyperplane arrangement, so in, e in each case, basically, the edge set gives me the ground set. So E is just E, the ground set of a matroid is the edge set, and then basically you take the vectors to be the I minus EJ, where IJ form an edge. So 
these are my elements of the matroid. So in particular, that's called the graphical matroid. Which edges give me independent sets of the matroid? Which collections of edges? Forest. Yeah, that's actually right. Spanning forest. Um, it depends on what I mean by I, I want to use all the vertices. Wait, what's not? Uh, oh, well, I guess what I'm saying is, hmm, what what am I saying? Uh, what I'm saying is that if G is this graph, then this to me is a spanning forest. So I'm using the same set of vertices, but I'm, I may or may, may not use some of the edges. Yeah, we don't care about vertices. Yeah, so, so we choose a bunch of edges so that you don't create any cycles. That's the, that's the definition here. Right, yeah, so for multigraphs, and actually in vector configurations, I'm allowing also to have zero vectors and parallel vectors, and each of them gives me a matroid. So maybe, yeah, I should, I should maybe try an example. Let's say G is a graph which looks, yeah, do I have an example here? Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter, it's just a random example. So I draw some random example, it has to be connected, but, and then I label the edges. One, two, three, four, five. So E, the ground set is one, two, three, four, five. And then the independent sets are, well, maybe the maximum independent sets. Let's say one, two, four is in my independent set, is an independent set, or maybe one, two, five. So these are considered different independent sets. And then maybe one, four as well, and et cetera. So, yeah, you allow loops, but like if, if you have a loop, then it just never appears in the list of independent sets. And these four and five never appear together. Independent set. And similarly for vectors, you could have zero vectors which never appear or parallel vectors. Yeah. I less than J. Um yeah, um I less than J. Yeah, for every edge, I want to take only one vector. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, still, this is not like, if you have a, if you have a multiple edge, I'm writing this as a set, but yeah, just forget about this. This is the correct definition. I mean, I could say I could have a collection of vectors labeled by all the edges of my graph. Any other questions? Um. Uh, right, so, uh, well, is every, well, first of all, graphical matroids are realizable. So a non-realizable matroid, actually all these examples, like here, hyperplane arrangements, graphs, whatever, they all, uh, they all come from just vector configurations. So in particular, vector configurations so far for us is like the most uh, broad class, but actually, yeah, gra graphical matroids are very special. And they, they are like the smallest class out of these things I mentioned. Okay. There's one more example which I'd like to mention. Sort of important one called the uniform matroid. And so you fix two integers k and n, and then you take u, k, n. That's the uniform matroid. So the ground set is, is just bracket n, right? And the independent sets are all possible independent sets of size at most k. I subset bracket n, such that the size of i is at most k. Right. So again, you can you can easily check that this satisfies the 
matrix axiom. Is this realizable or not? Okay, right. So if I take n generic vectors in R to the k, then this is going to give me the uniform matrix. So there is no non-trivial linear dependence between the between the vectors. All right, and uh, what I have ten minutes. All right, let's try some other some other definitions. I shouldn't erase this. Okay, but here's another easy definition. When are two matroids isomorphic? I have two matroids M and M prime, uh, M maybe P comma I, and M prime, P prime comma I prime are isomorphic if and only if what? Right, okay, if and only if there is a bijection, bijection from E to E prime, which induces a bijection between the independent sets. Okay, now uh, that, that's a useful definition. To, so, so, so this is different from a fine equivalence of vector configurations and linear equivalence. This is much more broader, right? You could, you could take a generic vector configuration and then you can move them in a generic way in any way you want and you're gonna get the same uniform matroid, for example. Okay. Uh, now let me, this is very inconvenient, but let me also talk about basis. So basically, if you have a matroid, of course it's defined by independent sets, but there is many different ways to define it. So there is, uh, M has independent sets, but also it has basis. So a basis of a matroid M is a maximal, maximal by inclusion by inclusion independent set. All right. So, okay, here's the lemma. All bases of any matrix M have the same size. You know this for, true for vectors, right? If you have any vectors, then the, any, any two bases have the same size. How do you show this for, uh, for arbitrary matroids by only using the axiom? Okay, proof. Take, yeah, by the way, notation here is that B of M is the set of bases of M. So I take B1, B2, two bases of M and assume that assume B1 is smaller than B2. Then what do I do? Uh, then the exchange axiom tells me that there is an element in B2 which I can add to B1 and still get an independent set. This violates the third exchange axiom. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to you want to mimic infinite dimensional vector spaces and vector configurations inside of those. I've never thought of this. I don't know how much is known about it. Uh, probably something should be known, but yeah, I don't. I don't know how. To... I, I... Yeah. 
Yeah, you want to yeah, have all bases to have the same cardinality. Yeah, I don't know how to say this axiom for infinite sets. To, to, to just say this just cardinality-wise, I think this is too weak to... Yeah, anyways, uh, I'm not sure how to do this for infinite sets, infinite dimensional spaces. That's my conclusion. But yeah, anyways, this simple lemma tells you that every matroid has a rank. Definition, the rank of M is the size of any basis. of M. What if there is no basis? Could it happen? Hmm? You have to have at least the empty set. Okay, right. So each, if there is no, there is a matroid whose only independent set is the empty set. Right? If you just take, uh, is it realizable by the way, or No, why not? Uh, okay, take the yeah, right. So, so my ground set is fixed. I could have like five elements in E, and then just the empty set as the independent set. Is that realizable? Yeah, take a bunch of zero vectors, right? So that that is realizable. If you take several zero vectors, that's perfectly fine matroid. So yeah, the rank could, could could be any number between zero and n, and the uniform matroid is defined yeah for for k equals to zero. That's precisely what you get. All right. Um, yeah, I think I'm almost out of time. Yeah, let let me give you axioms for. Let me give you axioms for for the basis vectors. So you could, uh, and many people actually define matroids not the way I did, but using basis instead. Here is a proposition. Let's say E is any finite set. And then you choose some collection of potentially ba basis of some matroid. Just any collection, any collection of sets. And then the claim is that B is the set of bases of a matroid if and only if here I'm going to only have to use two axioms and one there's all but one are going to be trivial b is non empty and then the second axiom is that if you have any two sets so that's the exchange Axiom. Take any two any two bases, and then you choose an element in I minus J. Then uh, here I'm not I, I don't impose any assumptions on the size. So can you guess what should be true for the basis? Uh, subset of J. Yeah, actually, it's even and yeah, remove a J from J and add an I. Or uh, yeah, that's actually. Um, so the claim is that well, actually, what you said is slightly different from what uh, from what it says in, uh, over here. Then there exists a J in J minus I such that I without I union J is a basis. And what you said is J without J union I is a basis. And it's different. And that we're actually in the, I mean, this would be two different axioms. So, and we're going to discuss the relation between these two axioms. But yeah, so this one, you have two bases, and you have one element that's in, in the first basis, but not the second. And then you can, you can remove that element and add some other element from the basis to still get a basis. So that's the exchange axiom. And so this, that's a proposition. The proposition that this is a matroid if and only if that is a matroid. And, and so the proof is an exercise.
basically there is like five theorems like that for, for, for different collections of objects which factorize matroids and it's very annoying to prove all the equivalences but it's, uh, it's a good exercise if you want to practice the axioms. All right, I'm out of time so I'll see you all on Friday and thanks a lot for coming to the lecture. <laughs>